Hi everyone. We got a few more topics in chemistry today for you. Today let's look at electron configurations of ions. We looked at atoms before. Now let's just follow the same process for ions. We'll also take a quick introduction to acids and bases, and then we'll discuss naming ionic compounds. And then finally, we'll have a look at some polyatomic ions. All right, electron configuration. So we're gonna follow the same procedure before. We're going to use the periodic table. And um, that's step one. <laughs> use the periodic table when trying to find the location of all the electrons in an ion. And just follow the same process you did for neutral atoms. Cool, so start with that. And then after you have the neutral atoms, you're gonna make an adjustment to your electron configuration. What's the adjustment? Well, anions are atoms with extra electrons. So we need to add more electrons. So just use the periodic table and see where the next electrons are going to go. If it's a cation, however, you need to backtrack. Um, cations are atoms which are missing electrons. So you're gonna to have to remove them. Now here's the trick is you should go back and watch that video on electron, sorry, ion, ionization energy and electron affinity. Ionization energy is the amount of energy it takes to remove an electron from an atom or an ion. So when we remove electrons from cations, yeah, we're taking them out, it takes ionization energy. The thing you have to remember is that nature's kind of lazy. She's gonna take the valence electrons out first the electrons on the surface. So when we have transition metals, it turns out that the S electrons will be in higher shells than the D electrons. And so the outermost electrons, so the valence electrons, higher shell, uh, electrons in higher shells, those have to come out first before the D, okay? And it just kind of makes sense if you think about ionization energy, Nature being lazy, she wants to take the electrons at the surface out first. They're easier. So they're in the higher shell. So we just have to remember that anytime we're writing electron configuration for the transition metals, got to remember this little exception. Okay, got a couple of, we have um, vanadium here, V, to show you that, um, I sort of like that exception to this process. All right, let's start with the basics though. Electron configuration of ions, use a periodic table. Find the configuration for the neutral atom, then adjust. For anions, we're gonna add more electrons. So, you might have this problem on the next exam. The question would read, write the electron configuration for O2 minus. O2 minus, what the heck is that? Well, use the periodic table, right? Find the letter O, it's over here. It's oxygen. Cool, okay. So, we got oxygen, and step one is to find the electron configuration for an atom, a neutral atom, right? So, oxygen is element number eight. Atomic number eight means eight protons. If the atom is neutral, it has an equal number of electrons, so eight electrons. So now the task is, where are those eight electrons? Well, remember the short shortcut. These first two columns, that's supposed to be a bracket, sorry. Um, electrons that are found in these two columns are the S electrons. Electrons in this, these 10 columns of the transition metals are D electrons. These electrons in this last six columns are the P electrons. And then those extra rows at the bottom of the periodic table are the F, F electrons. And those are the subshells within our, our shells. The row numbers gives us the shell number. S, P, and F are the subshell numbers, numbers, letters. <laughs> okay, how does this work? Um, oxygen has eight electrons. Electron number one of oxygen goes in the same location as the one and only electron of hydrogen, which is in the S block, first row. First row means shell one, S block. Um, right here is where helium is supposed to go. 
It's element number two. I know it's on the far side over here. It's not really in the P block. We're trying to fill the first shell, shell number one. There's a subshell, and the S subshell can take two electrons. So first electron for hydrogen, second electron for helium, it's in the S subshell. Two of them go into the 1S subshell, 1S orbitals. Okay, where's electron number three? Well, element number three is right here in the second row. So now we're gonna, going to start filling the second shell. Element three is also in the S block. Electron number four, also S block, second row. And those are the two electrons, electrons number three and four, that fill up the 2s. Keep going, element number five is boron. It's now in the p block. Still second row, second row, second shell. p block, subshell. Electrons five, six, seven, ooh, and there's eight. Four electrons. Complete the electron configuration for neutral oxygen. But we didn't want that. We want the anion O2 minus. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, the oxygen atom has a net negative two charge because it has two more electrons, right? Electrons are negative. And if an atom has two more, it's got a net charge of minus two. <laughs> Technically, oxygen started with eight electrons, gained two electrons somehow, so it has 10. But it has eight protons. So the whole atom had eight pluses, 10 minuses. Add that up, it's negative two. Okay, so where are these 10 electrons? Well, the first eight are exactly the same places where they were in the neutral atom. Four here, but then we add two more. Electron number nine and 10 are the extra two electrons. And we got a total of six electrons filling the P subshell. And actually, 10 is one of those magic numbers, one of those special numbers that completes the shell. The second shell is now full. Neon has, naturally has 10 electrons. It has a full second and first shell, nice and stable. It's a noble gas, doesn't want to react. O2 minus is actually quite stable. You can make that because it has a complete shell. But what makes it a little reactive is the fact that it's not neutral. It's got a negative two charge. So it's going to do some chemistry. Anyways, we did it for anions, add extra electrons based on the charge, and just keep moving forward on the periodic table to position those electrons. Let's do lithium. Start with the atom. That's our next one. Li plus is what we're after. Lithium, when it's positively charged, is a cation. Okay, neutral atom. Well, where is Li? It's element number three. Where are the first two electrons? Of those three electrons, same two places that hydrogen and helium stored them in the 1s orbitals. So there's two electrons in the 1s. And then a neutral lithium, there's a third electron in the second row, S block. If you want to put a one here, you can. You don't have to, but if you like, totally acceptable. <laughs> okay, now that's a neutral atom, <clears throat> but we have the cation. So what we have to do, we have to adjust by removing electrons, right? To make it a cation, we have to ionize this, use ionization energy, kick out an electron. Which electron? The one that's farthest up in the highest shell. Why did I put a P here? That's an S. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We're in the S block. Yeah, okay. Second shell is higher than the first shell. So this electron, the 2s electron, has to leave so that the atom then can have a plus one charge. And so there's only two electrons left, and they are both in the 1s orbital. That makes sense. The original atom is 1s, two electrons. There's a single electron in the 2s. Hey, they make the cation. You kick out this one electron here that's in the 2s orbital. And the electron configuration for the the resulting cation is just 1s squared. Let's see, let's go to the right. Got a blank periodic table here, start all over. 
for the next cation, Mg2+. Okay, so take a deep breath, search the periodic table. If you don't see it, take another look. Um, the other guideline is that metals tend to lose electrons. So if they're cations, they're probably metals. So look on the left side where all the metals are. Remember this dividing line, this little staircase on the periodic table separates the metals from the nonmetals. If your atom, sorry, if your ion has a negative charge, take a look over on the right side. Nonmetals tend to gain electrons. Yeah, that's where oxygen was. Um, but we got magnesium, Mg. It's actually right here, element 12. Okay, so for the atom of magnesium, where are those 12 electrons? Well, in the same, they are in the same place where the eight electrons of oxygen were. So that was row one, S block. Hydrogen is in the S block. So hydrogen, helium fills the first row, first shell. And then electrons three and four, they're right here in the 2S, two electrons there. Stay in the second row and go to elements five through 10, six electrons wide in the P block, P block. We're in the second row, so that's P6. And that took care of 10 electrons. Move to electron number 11, that's in the third row, S block. And we wanna to go to 12, which is magnesium. So in the S row, S block, sorry, third row, there's two electrons, we're done. But the question wasn't for the neutral magnesium atom, it was for the plus two cation. So lose two electrons, which ones are easiest to remove? The ones in the highest shell, the third shell, not the second shell, that's one of the core electrons. Get the valence electrons out, and hey, you have to take out both of them to make it two plus. So just copy everything up to this electrons, the three S electrons, and they're gone. That's those two electrons had to leave in order to make this magnesium plus two. Why does nature do that? Why does she allow magnesium to become a plus two cation? Well, now there's two plus two is four plus six is 10. 10 electrons, hey, that's electron configuration of a noble gas, which is stable. Yep. Vanadium, vanadium is where? Right here in the D block. More importantly, it's a transition metal. So a little red, red flag should go off and realize, okay, there was something weird about transition metals. Well, what's weird is that you gotta remember to remove, put my little thing, there it is. You're gonna have to remove the S electrons before the D. And all we're doing is taking electrons out of the higher shell. Okay, vanadium, we're ready. Bring it on. Vanadium, there you are. Element 23. Okay, well, we just did magnesium. Vanadium has 23 electrons. The first 12 electrons look like magnesiums. Let me scroll a little bit to the right here so I can get the rest of the periodic table here. Okay, let's do vanadium as an atom, neutral atom. And of course, if you start to see the pattern, you can just go directly to the ion, um, the electron configuration of the ion. You don't have to show me your work for the atom. But if you don't see the pattern yet, this is actually a good idea, right? So let's just do the atom of vanadium first. 23 electrons, first 12, look just like magnesium's electrons. The 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. How many electrons is that? Well, two, let's just add up the exponents. The exponents are two plus two plus six is 10. So I'm at the electron configuration of neon. Keep going, we gotta get 23. Um, 11 and 12 are in the S block, third row. So three S squared. Electrons 13 through 18 are in the P block, third row, P block. Third row, P block, and there's six electrons six columns in the P block. Cool, you could add up your exponents. It should equal 18. 
So go to 19. 19 is in the fourth row. S block. Remember, this is the S block. First two columns. So electrons 19 and 20 go into the 4S orbital. Now we move into the D block where the transition metals are. And what row, <laughs> we're in the fourth row, what shell does the 21st electron go into? Yeah, we have to step back. So turned out that third row, sorry, third shell, the third shell was not full yet. Nature went ahead and started putting two electrons in that fourth shell. And then she went, well, let's go fill up the third shell. So when you're in the D electrons, you're one shell number less than the row number. I'm in the fourth row, but it's really the third shell where these D electrons are. Okay, and then vanadium um, is right over here, element 23. So the 21st electron is in the D block, so that's one D electron. No, electron number 22, second D electron, electron number 23, it's a third D electron. Yay, we got it for vanadium. Oh wait, that was just the atom. Yep. Now we want to make the cation. Cations, you have to lose electrons. You have to ionize them. You have to supply some energy to kick out their electrons. Which electron is easiest to remove? The ones in the highest shell, the fourth shell, not the third. I know, third shell got, third D got filled last. Nature, she makes the rules and said, mm -mm, I'm taking the lazy way out. These fourth, uh, sorry, these electrons in the fourth shell are farther from the nucleus. They're closer to leaving. Let's just yank those out. How many are you gonna yank out to get a plus one cation? You need to remove one electron. So copy everything else, 1s squared, 2s squared, 2p6, 3s squared, 3p6. Ooh, and now I'm at the valence shell, the outermost shell, 4s, well, it's not a two, we can kick one out. So just leave it like that, or you can put a number one here. And the 3d3, they're still there. They didn't get yanked out. What happens if you remove two more electrons? What happens if you want the plus three vanadium? By the way, these exist. Transition metals are weird. They can actually assume several different charges. I know, valence electrons, sorry, transition metals. <laughs> They're kind of like wild cards. So we have to be told what charge is gonna be on that transition metal, or we gotta give, somehow we gotta get some clues as to what the charge is. Right now we're told it's a plus three. Cool, okay. So technically, I would go back to the atom and say, okay, I need to lose three electrons. And nature says, well, I'm gonna be lazy. Who's the highest shell? Which electrons are in the highest shell? The forest electrons. Well, I can kick out those two. So copy everything else. 3p6, and now the 4s electrons are gone, both of them, because we have to remove three of them. So nature will take out the two found in the 4s, so they're gone. And now, now we need, we still need one more electron to leave for a total of three, right? Because we got a plus three cation. So now one of the d electrons, the three d electrons has to leave. So there was three, now there's only two. We are now missing a total of three electrons and the electrons in the highest energy shells were the ones that were removed. And we're done. So just follow the pattern for any of the elements. And that's how you predict the electron configuration for ions, cations and anions. Cool. All right, what else we got? Next topic. I think it's intro to acids and bases. Yes. Okay, so we're gonna see acids and bases throughout this semester of chemistry. And um, instead of just like throwing all the information right at you, let's just do it in chunks. So here's the first chunk. What's an acid? Well, there's actually a couple different ways to define it. Like I said, not throwing everything at you. There's a guy named Arrhenius. I think this is how you pronounce or spell his name, pronounce him for sure. 
Arrhenius, these are Arrhenius definitions, eh, in case you care. Um, more important is to know what they are rather than how they're named. What are acids by the Arrhenius definition? It's simply um, acids are molecules that somehow increase the number of H plus ions, hydrogen ions, in solution. And usually it's an aqueous solution. So a water solution, aqueous, agua, water, yeah, aqueous solution. Okay, so you have a molecule and you dump it into water and whoa, hey, a bunch of H pluses showed up. Where did these hydrogen ions come from? Hmm, that molecule you threw in there, that was an acid. Okay, start all over with some pure water and then throw in a molecule called a base. And that's something that now is going to increase the OH minus ions, hydroxide ions. That's the name of OH minus. And so you throw in these molecules into water, they dissolve, or maybe it's already in liquid form, whatever. And somehow you check the, the water solution and you discover, hey, there are more hydroxide ions, OH minus is here. Hey, whatever the molecule was, it is a base. There you go. Why is that special? Well, hydrogen ions, hydroxide ions actually form naturally in water. We'll talk about that later when we talk about pH, the pH scale. Um, right now, I need you to know is that H plus, OH minus carry opposite charges, so they attract each other. Um, something with a plus charge is technically a cation. Something with a negative charge, technically an anion. So this is the pair of ions Wait, don't pairs of ions form salts? Mm, not this one, here's another exception. It actually forms a, a neutral molecule that is not ionic, H2O. You know that as water. Yeah, so that's a special equation. Water is safe to drink, neutral pH, neither acidic nor basic. That's what I need you to know. Acids create H pluses, they're reactive. Bases create OH minuses, OH minuses are basic. But you mix them together, they neutralize each other. This reaction is actually called the neutralization reaction, where you have H pluses, OH minuses, neutralizing each other to form water. That's a nice stabilizing thing. Cool. So that was the first chunk of acids and bases. Here's a neat idea. Describe for me what an H plant H plus ion looks like. What is it? Well, let's go to the periodic table for some help. Where's H? Ooh, here it is. What does that mean? Um, it's element number one. Element number one, atomic number one, means how many protons? Mm, one. <laughs> okay, so H has one proton, a P plus, and one electron, right? Neutral atom has equal numbers of protons, electrons. So H plus is missing its one and only electron. It's a naked electron, that's a naked proton. It's not even an atom, right? Atoms are protons and electrons. This thing's not an atom. It is very reactive. So it's the only element on the table that can do this. Well, in naturally occurring ways. I mean, in the laboratory, we force one of the other elements to be completely stripped of its electrons and naked. And then, yeah, it's pretty reactive, but that's not very, that's not commonly seen. But H plus is commonly observed in nature. And so acids is just that part, that study of chemistry that explores the chemistry of naked protons that are known as H plus. There you go. Kind of insightful. Hope that helps in the future. Okay, here's some common acids. Um, we've got hydrochloric acid. It's one of the acids in digestive fluids in the stomach, stomach acid. So stomach acid is not pure HCl, but in the mixture of stomach acids, you will find hydrochloric acid. Got nitric acid here. That's a very reactive acid. It can dissolve copper. So <laughs> drop a penny in it in <laughs> a few minutes, it's gone. Um, sulfuric acid, very corrosive acid too. Okay, um, if you take more chemistry, yeah, we're gonna ask you to memorize these. These are very strong acids, and it's useful to know. This first level of chemistry, I just want you to see a pattern. The hydrogen is showing up first in the chemical formula. Now, that's not always true. You're getting used to exceptions to our, our guidelines and rules in chemistry, but it's a nice pattern that does seem 
to, to repeat. If a hydrogen is listed first in the, in the chemical formula, it's probably an acid. For example, um, acetic acid, well, that's a helpful name. What kind of species or molecule is acetic acid? Mm, something that increases H plus ions. <laughs> and it's found in vinegar. Cool. Okay, so that's cool. You've tasted vinegar before. It's very tart and sour. And that's because you're detecting all those naked protons in there, all those H pluses. Here is one way to write the chemical formula for acetic acid. There you go. And if you look at this, the hydrogen shows up twice. And so you might say, well, why did you make it so complicated? Why didn't you just write the formula like that? That's simpler. And I agree, that is simpler, but it's less informative. Looking at this formula, I don't know for sure it's an acid. If I look at this formula, I'm like, well, who's the knucklehead that pulled this hydrogen out there? Oh, wait, hydrogen listed first indicates an acid. Okay, so that's that's reason for it. Cool. Okay, so right now that's your pattern. If you see a weird chemical formula, and there's some crazy question on the exam, see if a hydrogen begins that formula. If so, that's probably an acid and maybe the answer is going to involve acid-base chemistry. The neutralization reaction. H plus with the OH minus making water. Um, let's look at some bases. Here are three common bases, sodium hydroxide, NaOH, potassium hydroxide, K, wait, K? Let's see, where's my periodic table? I think it's, ooh, there's one right here. Um, yeah, <laughs> for us, there we go, K, uh, right here, potassium. It's also an alkali metal, same family as sodium, so similar properties. Yep, so sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, and then we have magnesium hydroxide. We said earlier magnesium had a plus two charge. Hydroxide has a minus two. So nature says, hey, if you guys are gonna form charges, you better group up so you can cancel out all the charges and make it neutral. So the formula MgO2, Sorry, OH2, parentheses two, means you have two OH minuses, two hydroxides. And that's because you need a total of two negatives that balance your two positive. Turns out magnesium hydroxide is a compound you form that, that's found in Tums, antacids, right? So you chew on this tablet and it can relieve indigestion. Wait, why? Um, well, Tums, antacid, ooh, that's a good name anti-acid, attack acid. Um, the hydroxide ions from Tums, it's gonna attack the H pluses in hydrochloric acid, stomach acid, and create water. Ooh, that's gonna sell your stomach. Water is very calming, very neutral, very, very stable. Not like these acids and bases. Very cool. And so that gives us our other pattern. H is usually seen first in the chemical formula of acids, whereas OH, it's gonna show up usually, not always, usually shows up somewhere in the chemical formula. Oh, and sometimes you'll see the OH in a formula and it turns out not to be a base. That's unfortunate. So I guess um, the lawyer in me says, you know, well, read the fine print. <laughs> We're talking about usually OH showing up in a formula, chemical formula indicates of the base. Okay. Um, ooh, done with that part. Acids, bases, electron configuration. Let's talk about naming compounds. Naming ionic compounds. I think I'm too high here. Go down. There we go. Naming ionic compounds. Where are you? Here it is. Okay. So what I thought I would do, give some helpful hints here. Um, ionic compounds. Well, what does that mean? Ionic means ions, right? Cations and anions. And if you um, group cations with anions in the right ratios, you get equal number of pluses and minuses. Things cancel out, nature's happy. The molecule, the, the compound that is, has a net zero charge, neutral charge. Okay. And then if we go back to the periodic table and say, hey, which elements tend to form cations or tend to lose electrons? Those are the metals. 
And then which are the elements that tend to gain electrons? Well, those are the nonmetals. And when they gain electrons, the name for that atom is now an anion. And the name of an atom with positive charge, missing electrons, is a cation. Ooh, and if you make, you know, pair up a cation with anion in the right ratios, charges balance out. You make an ionic compound, and they're held together by ionic bonds. Let's exploit that idea to name these compounds. So ionic compounds, hmm, by definition, have to have cations and anions in them. They're made up of cations and anions. So the name is going to be based on what is your cation, usually the metal, and what is your anion, the nonmetal. And they'll identify the compound. They'll make a good name. So what was decided is like, hey, just simplify it. Go grab the name of that metal. <laughs> that is the first part of the compound name. Put a space there so we know that you're telling us something about the cation. And then next, after the space, there'll be something about the anion. Okay, they said, let's not use the full element name for the anion, because that might be confusing. Just take part of the name, the root, chop off the ending, basically, and add the ending ide. And ide is actually the indicator that we're probably, again, be the lawyer, um, we're probably talking about an anion, something with a negative charge. Okay, and that's the basis of the name. The name of the cation, which is the element name, then part of the anion name, element name of the anion, and then tack on ide. We'll do a couple. We got three of them here in a second. But then we always have this fine print. <laughs> oh boy. Transition metals, darn you. What's your problem? Well, here they come in. We already said that transition metals can have multiple charges. Right? Vanadium had a plus one and a plus three. Well, which one is it? We're gonna have to get some information. And if I name the compound, I have to supply that information. So if you have a transition metal in your ionic compound, you have to tell us what the charge is. And the way to tell it is by supplying the Roman numeral for that charge. And if you haven't seen Roman numerals in a while, here they are, Roman, you know, this is one, two, three, three letter I's makes three. The one that I get confused on is four versus six. So the letter V is a Roman numeral five. And if you put a one after, it means to add it. So this is six. But if you put the one first, that means subtract it from five. So one minus five is four. And we shouldn't go higher than eight. Eight's Pretty unstable, right? How's an atom getting a plus eight charge? Uh, some exist. So we'll talk about those later. But if you encounter an atom that you have to name, or a molecule that you have named with a cation has a plus eight charge and it's transition metal, you're going to need a Roman numeral eight. If you've seen the names of organic compounds, oh, sorry, the names of compounds before, and you have, you've heard of carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide, CO2. Okay, carbon dioxide is not ionic. It obeys a different pattern for names. So if you've heard of ditribe, tetra, even mono, those prefixes do not show up in ionic compounds. So just don't use them. You get dinged and get some points taken away. So they don't show up in ionic compounds. One less thing to worry about. Don't put them in there. There you go. Okay, let's give it a try. What the heck's the name of NaCl? So use the periodic table. You get one on every of my every one of my exams. So go find Na. Okay, it's over here. It's a metal. Now it's not always true, but it should be <laughs> that when you write the formula name, usually the metal, the cation is listed first, and the anion second. I definitely will follow that pattern on my exams. So sodium, if you can't remember where it is, it's listed first, it's probably metal. Check the left side of the periodic table. Yay, there it is, element 11. So if you had no idea what Na was on your periodic table, which looks like this one on the exam, you can just read underneath the symbol. Underneath Na is sodium. So Na has the element named sodium, and that is the beginning of the salt of the compound. 
Did I mention that yet? Ionic compounds are also called salts. So inter 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 interchangeable. Mm. Okay, what the heck is Cl? It's over here on the left side with the non-metals. It's chlorine. Element 17 is Cl with the name chlorine. And that's the element name, chlorine. But we only want to take the root or part. So we're going to drop the ion ending and add the ide ending, the ide suffix. So the name of this is sodium chloride. And you probably already knew that. Table salt is sodium chloride. Cool. Um, next one is MGBR, two. Ooh, do you have to do anything two? Nope, no dye. Nope, you don't use that dye prefix, just what the heck's MG? Um, it's a metal, magnesium. What's BR? Well, over here it's bromine but we're gonna drop the ion and add ide. So that becomes bromine. Done, I like it. Next one, SR3, N2. SR, uh, well, I'll check the metal side. I don't see it, well, because it's lower on the table. There we go, so let's, uh, that was SR3, I believe, N2. Okay, SR is right here, it's strontium, element 38. So on the exam, right, take a deep breath. I know there's a lot to skim through, but it's here somewhere. So SR turns out to be element 38, strontium, and just copy the name, S-T-R-O-N-T-I-U-M. Strontium. Got half the name, get half the credit. What's N2? Um, N. Oh, um, cation listed first, anion second. So anions are nonmetals. Oh, here's N. Nitrogen, so grab nitrogen at ide. No, okay, you need to chop off something. <laughs> and, that, and then the more you do this, you'll know how much to chop. So nitrogen is here, so this, do I just drop off the gen? Do I chop off the en? So is it nitrogide? Um, depending on how good a job you do, I probably would just, as long as you chop something off on my exams and add the ide, I know you're trying. I'll probably give you full credit. But you actually drop off ogen and it's nitride. So there's the ide ending. Cool. Um, did we do them all? We did all those three. Let's try these three. Okay. Now, should do a little better planning. Can I squeeze this up? Mm, there, good. Okay, we got CuCl and CuCl2. Ooh, so if we forgot that Cu, what the heck is that? Um, it's right here, it's element 29. It's in the D block. No, it's more importantly, it's a transition metal. Little red flag goes off again. What about transition metals? You have to report its charge as a Roman numeral. Okay, if you forgot to do that, then what's the difference between these two compounds? The name wouldn't be different if you didn't report the charge. It turns out that CuCl is a white powder. CuCl2 is blue. And they have other properties that are different too. So there's a big difference. Um, so what's the name of CuCl? Well, follow the pattern. First thing is a metal, an, a cation. It's element 29. It's copper. Okay, so just write copper. The cation name is, as is the, the element name of the, of the metal. And then the other piece is the anion, Cl. Well, that's element 17, chlorine, but we change that to chloride. And if you walk away from that problem, you don't get full credit. Why? Because if you try and name CuCl2, the element is copper for the cation, the anion is chlorine, you change the chloride, you're gonna come up with the same exact name. And these are different compounds, right? If you have identical twins, you're not gonna call them the same thing, you're gonna make their names different. So we'd have to do the same thing. These are different compounds, they deserve different names. So what's the charge on copper? 
So then you might say, well, I'll just look at the periodic table and predict it. And where's the valence electron? <laughs> it ain't here. You can't predict the charge of the transition metals from the periodic table. You need another clue. So what's the clue? Chlorine. You can predict chlorine's charge. Chlorine is in the row seven. It has seven valence electrons. It wants eight. Another way of thinking about it, it wants to fill its shell and be like argon. It just needs one more electron to do it. So chlorine has a negative charge. And then nature says, if you guys are going to be charged, if you're going to be ionic, somebody plus, somebody minus, group up to neutralize the charge. So one copper, one chlorine somehow cancels out the charge. Copper has to have a plus one charge. So right next to copper, in parentheses, put a Roman numeral one. But this blue salt, there's one copper. And now there's two chlorines, Cl2. The chlorines each still have a minus one charge. And each says, OK, if you're a neutral salt, neutral ionic compound, you have to balance out charge. What must copper's charge be? Well, it must be plus two. So all together, these three ions now balance the charge. OK. So Roman numeral two indicates now this copper has a plus two charge. Last one of this of these examples, we have FeO2. What's the name of this? I'm always seeing the pattern, right? Fe is going to be a metal, so scan the table. Oh, here it is. Fe is right here. It's iron. So yay, got half credit. Well, not quite half, because that's a transition metal. We have to report its charge. So I'll put parentheses to remind me, because I can't go to the periodic table and say, oh, element 26, I know your charge. No, you don't, not from the periodic table. We need some more information. Um, what's the other information? Well, what's the anion? It's O. O is oxygen. So the atom name of oxygen is oxygen. <laughs> and now we're going to chop off the Ygen part and then add ide. So this is oxide. This is iron oxide. So now we're getting more points. What's the charge? What's the Roman numeral? Well, can't predict iron's charge, but I can predict oxygen's charge. It's the eighth element with eight electrons. It wants 10. It wants to be like the other noble gas, the nearest noble gas. And so if it has eight, it wants two more. So somehow, it became negatively charged, and it did get those two more electrons. And this compound, though, there's two oxygens, so they both have a minus two charge. And there's one iron. And somehow they group up to balance the charge. So what's the charge on iron? A plus four, right. And so what's Roman numeral four? We got to subtract the one. There we go. So it's IV. IV means four, I guess. <laughs> but one V, yeah, IV, yep. There we go. Iron four oxide is the chemical name for FeO2. Nice. Okay. Let's see. Ooh, we still have more. I feel like I'm missing something. Oh, wait, no, this is the next topic. It's kind of blended together. Uh, the last topic of this um, little video is polyatomic ions. So um, I guess I started out by saying, hey, name this compound MgO2, sorry, Mg parentheses OH with a 2. We actually did that earlier. We got OHs showing up in our molecule. So that means it's probably a base. There you go. So it turns out it's magnesium hydroxide. How are we going to remember that? Practice. So we're going to have to memorize that, especially OH minus. That's a really important ion. 
OH minus, well, it's got an oxygen, which is a non-metal. It's got a hydrogen, that's an exception. I know it's on the left side of the table, but it's floating off the periodic table. Hydrogen is a non-metal. And so the, now the oxygen and the hydrogen are sticking together, bonding together, not ionically. These are both non-metals. They bond together through a covalent bond. And that's the subject of our next video. But right now, I just need you to know, O and H don't stick together ionically. But somehow nature says, that's fine. O sticks to H. And you know what? Together, you guys have a net negative one charge. And you're fine. You're stable. Do something. Um, yeah, it's going to find an H plus. OH minus will react with H plus to make neutral water. The hydroxide ions exist. They're stable enough to form in water. Then they can do some base chemistry. And we just got to memorize OH minus has the name hydroxide. So if I ask you to name this compound, you'll say, well, you got Mg, that's on the left side of the table. Here's Mg, element 12. OH, well, O is over here on the right side. Hydrogen's also non-metal, like oxygen's a non-metal. And usually ionic compounds are when metals bind to non-metals. So metals sticking to non-metals is probably ionic. Cool. The name it then. Name your cation. Mg was magnesium. Look it up on the periodic table. You don't have to memorize that. Ooh, but O with an H and oxygen with the hydrogen. What if it was H with an oxygen like that? Ho, ho, ho. Sorry. Um, we have hydroxide, hydroxide. So there is some logic here. And I know there's that too, but no ditrite tetras in ionic names. That's done. Magnesium hydroxide. What about this one? Ti, SO4, and there's two of those SO4s. Well, Ti, periodic table says element 22 is titanium. So now I got the song in my head. I am titanium. Okay. Um, sorry. Distractions. <laughs> so we got partial credit. There's the cation name for this compound Ti, parentheses SO4, subscript 2. What the heck is SO4? Well, we got sulfur, we got oxygen, sulfur, oxygen. It's actually sulfate. So I write this and I'm about ready to leave saying, yay, I got the name. Oh man, my little red flag didn't go off. When I grab titanium's name, I gotta remember I'm in, I'm in the transition metals. I need to report the charge. I need a space in here too. So what's the charge on sulfate? Ah, yes, we gotta memorize that, so I know. This is one of the things that does make chemistry more difficult than other courses. There is a, a certain amount of memorization that's required. Sorry. So here's the list for this class. And yeah, it turns out this is an incomplete list. Well, for our class right now, this is complete. I won't add any others. If I do, I won't require that you memorize them. But this list needs to be memorized because these are very common ions we see all the time in chemistry. And it's worth a while to memorize them. It's going to earn you points, right? But more importantly, it's going to help you get through the course. So over here is OH minus hydroxide, and it's showing us with the negative one charge. Hey, here's SO3. No, no, no. It was SO4. Double check, please. Yeah. Hmm. There, SO4 is this one. And SO4 has the name sulfate, and SO4 carries a net minus two charge. Okay, so then in titanium sulfate, there's one Ti, transition metal, can't predict its charge. It's determined by the anions. Subscript two says there's two sulfates. What's the charge on sulfate? You have to memorize it's two minus. And now nature says, okay, if we're gonna make a salt, balance the charge. Two sulfates give you a total of minus four. 
titanium. Can you handle a plus four charge? That's a transition metal. It says, yeah, no problem. Um, and it's IV, Roman numeral. Titanium four sulfate is the name of that compound. Cool. Last detail, all these polyatomic ions, um, there are a couple of cations, but they all carry charge. They all are stable in water. Well, some are more stable than others. More about that later, but these all exist in water. And then um, if I say, well, what, what, how many, let's see, where's my sample question down here? How many ions form when these compounds dissolve? Well, how many ions? Well, find out how many cations and how many anions you have and add them together to answer this question. And well, copper is a metal, chlorine is a non-metal, and there's two of them. If we go to the periodic table, we'll find that chlorine is a minus one. Copper is a transition metal. You have to balance a charge. We did this earlier, right? So you can re rewind the video and see how we got the charge again. But there's a total of three ions in CuCl2. Three ions. So when you take this blue powder, stir it in water, wait long enough for all the little blue crystals to dissolve, in the water solution, aqueous, for every one salt compound, CuCl2, they'll separate out three ions, a copper two plus ion and two chlorine minuses, two chloride ions, chloride. What about this? Well, it's kind of the same pattern. Magnesium comes out as an Mg. Go to the periodic table and find out it's in column two. Is my periodic table close? It is. Where's Mg? It's over here, element 12. It's in the second column. It wants to lose two of its 12 electrons to be like neon, the nearest noble gas, element 10, top right of the screen. Yeah, magnesium, 12 electrons, goes down to 10 naturally, the form of plus two cation. And then the OHs, the O stays stuck to the H. The O is bonding to the H through a covalent bond and the water won't break that apart. So the O stays attached to the H and there's two of those. The O stays attached to the H. And now you can play this game. You're supposed to memorize the charge in OH minus, but if you forget, you can always go back to nature's rule that, hey, if this is a salt, then all the charges have to balance. And if Mg is two plus, which it is from the periodic table, each hydroxide ion must have a minus one charge. So that minus one, minus one equals a minus two to balance a plus two. This was tougher though. Ti is just titanium. We can't predict the charge of this transition metal. Subscript two says we have two sulfates. Well, I guess if you, and then you have to know, this is polyatomic. The S's stick to those. And then I guess you can answer the question. You know those three things. Maybe you don't know the charges, but there's three ions total. If I ask for the charges, you have to go to your brain. <laughs> it's the only place you got on exam. Sulfate has a minus two charge. And so titanium must balance that charge and you can figure out it must be a plus four. There you go. Hey, that's enough for now. Take care. See you in the next video.